Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome back to another week of Inside Major League Pickleball. MLP Daytona Beach is complete. The Seattle Pioneers are your 2023 MLP Daytona Beach champs in the premier level. And congratulations to the Bay Area Breakers. They are the challenger level champs back to back. Impressive run for them. We have a very special guest on this week that knows a thing or two about making it to the finals in both the premier and the challenger level. So we will get to that in just a moment. But first, a quick shout out to our sponsors, ProXR, the official paddle of MLP, the only paddle custom fit for your grip. Knock around the official sunglasses of MLP, quality shades that won't break the bank, and Aura Organic, the official nutrition partner of Major League Pickleball. Transform your health with plant-based nutrition from Aura. As always, I'm one of your hosts, sports broadcaster, and one of the voices of Major League Pickleball. The rasp is almost clearing up, but Maybe one upping me in the RASP department, Tyson Apostle this week, and Casey Patterson, uh, reality show legend, Olympic volleyballer. You know who these guys are at this point. <laughs> and last but not least, PPA's lead broadcaster, top current senior pro. He was one of my OG broadcast partners here in the sport of pickleball. Actually, the first. Yes. Uh, he is the GM of both the Seattle Pioneers in the premier level and the runner-up team from the challenger level, the Dallas Pickleball Club. And Dave Fleming joins us now. He really needs no introduction. Everyone in the pickleball world knows him. They love him. Dave, welcome. We're so happy to have you this week. Thrilled to be here. Great to see you guys. How are you? Good. Let's dive right in. Wait, Beach. wait, wait okay, one wait. second. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Wait, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. So, Dave. God, is that you? <laughs> <laughs> Dave. <laughs> When MLP Mesa was here, Dave texted me. He's like, Tyson, let's get a game together. Uh, we we played. We had so much fun. Yes. Uh, super awesome. But that's neither here nor there. This is, There was a conversation where I was like, Dave, on the broadcast, as soon as someone scores the first point, you need to say only one of these teams can now get pickled. And I was like, you can have that. Just <laughs> share it. And, like, <laughs> signa- every time one team, every single match, every single everything, every time the first point is scored, say only one of these teams can be pickled. It can be a cool signature thing. I've been watching the broadcast all weekend. I didn't hear it once. Didn't hear it once. <laughs> Dave, is, am I not as clever as I think I am? Or do uh, you just want me to have that for myself? I, you know, I hate to take other people's lines, Tyson, and you're a legend, so why would I go and do that? <laughs> okay, fair enough. I, I feel snubbed. You haven't given me any any. You can use that or... line. You can okay. use that line. There you go. It's available to anyone here, who's willing here, to use it. Yeah. Michelle, I bequeath it. <laughs> I gave yeah, it to yeah. Dave. He yeah. didn't want it. He's given it to you. That's a new word for me. <laughs> bequeath it. Yeah. Thank bequeath you. Bequeath it. <laughs> So, man, uh, I watched. Thank you for uh, sharing that. Tyson. So hopeful. Just every match, every game. <laughs> I was like, here it is. This is the one. Is Dave commentating? I got to tune in right now. You're only watching the beginning of every game. Yeah, the beginning yeah, of every game. Turn it off. And then <laughs> mute. Mute. <laughs> then Out of spite, I muted it. I muted Dave after the first point was scored and that line wasn't said. He just dumps me. <laughs> no, we're st- we're still great because Michelle's going to use that next next time yes. she's on stream. Next and then time, <laughs> everything will be perfect for us. It'll be great. So, Thanks, Tyson. Yeah, that was an insightful little nugget. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Right, <laughs> okay. Michelle. Let's get into it. I like that you leave this off with a banger. Thank you, yeah. everybody. Thank you. Now you get to tune in and listen to us all commentate. Uh, GM by day, pickleball broadcaster by night. What don't you do, Dave Fleming? (laughs) Let's talk about the eerie similarities between both the challenger level and the premier level. Uh, There's so many things I can ask you, but just encapsulate your entire experience from being the GM of two teams that made it all the way. Obviously, you're the you're the X Factor. It's no longer (laughs) Irina Tereschenko. It's Dave Fleming. Yeah, we found the new X Factor. (laughs) Wow. Just well, so do you ass. think if you put Irina and Dave on the same team that oh, they'd be unstoppable? It yeah. would be I dynasty. So. <laughs> I would love to have Irina on a team, and who knows? Maybe, uh, maybe in the in the second round of this, we get that. You know, I'm. Uh, it's it's an unbelievable privilege to be a part of this sport the way I have been, and and in this particular instance, to see 
two wildly different types of teams both get to the finals. I have a very loud team in the Challenger uh, League that is full energy, team chirp, going bananas, and then just the steady, stellar play of the Pioneers. And, you know, when, when you look at roster construction, you have to kind of figure out what do you want to do with that. And, and then ultimately, you got to give each player individual attention if needed to get them to play their best. Because Major League Pickleball is a grind, not just from the physical, but mentally. These players aren't used to playing on a team. They, they get dropped into this, and all of a sudden, others are counting on them. And, you know, to see two teams play that well all weekend long and have a winner and a runner-up was just a thrill that I'll never forget. You, you just opened up so much for us here, Dave. <laughs> so much it's so perfect. two different well, teams so you've got two different teams with two different yeah. energies how do you manage them differently and is that a juggle for you to is it a struggle to separate the two teams in your mind because you're going back and forth a little bit especially yeah. that first you know the the friday and the saturday right yeah it's all fire it's like fire and ice just what temperature <laughs> what temperature yeah. am i where do i be <laughs> yeah that's totally, that's totally right and wardrobe change uh but uh, yeah <laughs> i didn't even think about that shoes yeah. i, mean, I know i already know what he did he I put on <laughs> he looked at the schedule and he's like okay what team's playing first i'll put uh that shirt on last so he just got a stack yeah, of yeah. shirts every other shirt <laughs> so he can just pull one off and go to the next one that's exactly right you're on to me tyson as yeah. always eight t-shirts uh, deep eight i mean I, has so dave been they, lifting no <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's at the top of everybody's thoughts yeah, dave's, dave's, dave's thrown up 250 in the gym this week yeah dave's Bulking in the phase. ped discussion yeah <laughs> just kidding now we know who we need to test exactly yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but let's no, get back to it. Yeah. These energy yeah. balances, like how do yeah. you how do you manage that on the days where they're both playing? Yeah, I think a uh, couple things. Number one, being a player, I understand what individual people need, and then also my background. I I led very big teams in my corporate background before I got into pickleball at Pizza Hut and Dr Pepper, and you can't manage every person the same or you will fail. You need to understand what their strengths and weaknesses are. And that carried over very well to this role as coach general manager of pickleball players, because first of all, you have to have their trust and respect. And I appreciate that through what I've been able to do that they will listen to my game. So when you look at, if we look at Dallas first, Dallas is a team where we made two big changes. We can talk about that in a minute. Um, and that team, the reason we made the changes was we won our first five matches in Mesa. Just played great. The Aces are a very good team. We beat them 3 nothing. We were up 2 nothing against Atlanta. We're cruising, man. All we got to get is one of the mix or the dream breaker, and we're through. Lost all three of those and then got run over in our last match. Didn't even have any energy. And I'm like, this can't work. So we made a couple changes there. And I wanted a team that really could go after the energy, but then each person is different. So, you know, Brandon French is so crazy and wild and plays a different style. And you just need to keep him focused on what he can do because his, his talent is enormous. We brought Jill Braverman in. Again, lots of fire. Let's make sure it's, <laughs> it's channeled right. And then their partners have to be able to meld into that. And you need to make sure that they match that energy, but we don't try to win with just screaming and yelling. It's the play and being strategic. And sometimes that can get lost in all of the other stuff. The flip side of all that is what the pioneers are all about. I mean, we left Mesa not happy about the semis uh, that we lost there. We, we lost to a team that played better than we did. They deserved to win. Um, and then you look at each of the players. Obviously, Ben is Ben. Ben doesn't need to hear from me. Ben just needs a consistent, positive voice from me, which is what I give to him. But Megan, MVP, thank you very much, <laughs> left there and said, hey, what are some things I should work on? So she took that personally coming out of, out of Mesa. And 
I was so proud of the work that she put in between Mesa and Daytona, and you could mm. see it on the court. It was phenomenal. Tyler Lung is always going to be steady. And then probably the biggest one is Etta Wright. Etta Wright is crazy talented. Etta Wright yeah. is someone me and Ben desperately wanted to draft, and we're thrilled. If she goes 23rd in the next draft, let me tell you, I hope it's me picking 23rd, because she ain't getting <laughs> that far if, mm. if I'm somewhere else. She is a stud. And she just needs to be reminded that she's a stud. She is so just chill that to get off to a good start is the key with her. And if you watch the final, my goodness, Etta Wright was everywhere. So, yes, I am switching and talking to the players in a very different way, all eight of them. So you did mention like the changes in Dallas and after leaving Mesa, you needed to make some changes. What specifically were you looking for? Like what changes needed to be made? And did you have specific people in mind or more just like specific talent set? Yeah, I think it was a couple of things. Number one is the energy, as I mentioned, you know, to lose that many in a row just didn't seem feasible, but it happened. And you know, so then you, you look at, well, what pieces could become available? And I said all along, Megan Fudge is untouchable, okay? Not trading her. But then Jill Braverman shows up in the shuffle draft, and I was like, okay, I know her game. I would really like to have her on my team. How can I pull that off? And I think this is the part of Major League Pickleball that no one sees the the true like <laughs> NFL, with all due respect, GMing in the background and calls and discussions and how do we do this and can we pull this off? And I just felt like her, number one, her talents, and secondly, just her energy was exactly what we needed. And I had to change my mind on Megan. I didn't want to trade Megan. I was thrilled to pick her with the third pick, but I just thought that for MLP getting Jill Braverman was critical to our team. And then I was like, well, where's her game at? And very fortunately for me, Jill happened to be in Dallas three days before we had to get, make all that go down. So I got to be on the court with her and I played and I saw, okay, this woman is on point. She is going to be a great addition. Now can we figure out a deal that makes sense? And the Megan for Jill heads up swap took some time, but it, uh, Ended up working out. I was thrilled that Columbus got through as well with Megan, and Jill was huge for our team. So that was part one. The second part was Brandon and Chuck just didn't get where I thought they could. I mean, Chuck was the first guy I picked. I was excited to have him. And this is the really hard part of uh, general managing. It's the human part. I mean, Chuck Taylor's a great guy. He's a good player. And I have to call him and tell him, hey, I'm making a change. That is not an easy conversation to have, but yeah. it's, it's part of this role that I have. And, you know, he was incredibly professional. I knew he would be, but that is not a lot of fun to tell somebody that they don't get to play in major league pickleball. Um, so then you got to go, okay, what do you want? And if, so then I was, maybe I can get the second pick. Cause I think Brendan Long's going to come do very well as he did. And I'm not surprised. And that couldn't get done despite another, long series of, of calls and conversations and you know then we looked at three or four people I talked to all three or four of the players that we considered and you know Daniel De La Rosa obviously is an incredibly talented guy he's the best racquetball player in the freaking world of all the humans <laughs> put them together I'll take Daniel yeah. um, <laughs> and you know so to have a guy that can handle that kind of pressure um, has played MLP before, was a big consideration. Someone I knew was a big part of it, and he played fantastic. So those changes were necessary, and I was thrilled that the results came through behind it. And on, on the premier level side, yeah. not to switch gears too quickly, because I want to go back to <clears throat> Jill Braverman and the challenger side, but I'm having just come off of the championship call of the Seattle Pioneers, I want to know what was it that you told Megan Dazan to work on that changed her game so much because it was so apparent. I mean, and that's the hard part, right? Because Etta Wright could have easily been the MVP as For well. Sure. But like two players that were rock solid across the board. And, and to me, she was one of the players that took the biggest stride. So what was it that you told her and, and how 
what what did you see improvement wise yeah i saw a lot of improvement from her and you know it's the the fact that she asked you know tells you everything you need to know to start with after mesa i mean almost immediately after she wanted to do better i think you know ultimately it's the work i mean i can give some tips and suggestions but she's got to go put the work in on the court my goodness did she ever i think the things she has so much power and it's it's remarkable power because you see in the women's game these insane firefights i mean the the fives bears women's match was just outrageous with that and uh I uh, agree with everyone that said it's one of the best women's matches ever. And Megan has just even a little more pace. I mean, it's unbelievable how much pace she has. But it was the reaching in, being confident at the kitchen line so that she can take advantage of that and then improve her game in the transition area. And she did it. And she is on the rise. And I think that's the big the big thing that I'm thrilled about for our team. I mean, Etta and Megan are going to be better in San Clemente without question that's mm. exciting yeah that's rad i love that that confidence boost you almost gave you're like hey put the work in but remember you could be all dominant if you just yeah. had a little more confidence at the line here get things out of the air like you're already so powerful and a lot of times that's all an athlete needs is wait okay i need to work on this but he like everyone believes in me like even though you know like all right i know i'm here for a reason but just hearing it it could it turns the switch on, which it did for her. I mean, obviously, it was so fun watching them just dominate. And her ability to, like, speed the ball up from such a low yes. angle. And then her yeah. her dinking was so impressive, of like, low to the net. But they were, like, BBs coming from what it looked like from, from my vantage point. Yeah, I mean, which... I think the confidence to stay in that and then get yeah. the ball that you can use your power on. and. Again, and then staying true to where we wanted to put the ball. And I mean, I think that's a big differential too, is the teams that have, you know, we're not talking thousands of hours of you've got to do this, that, and the other. I don't think that's necessary, but the let's put the ball in the right place. Let's return the ball to the right place. And having that discipline is a, is a part of this as well. But uh, yeah. I was thrilled with how all eight players that I have the thrill to be a part of played I mean everybody played fantastic do you think that Jill Braverman on Columbus would have been as successful you know that's that's a question they'd have to answer but you know from from where I sit I think you either you get Jill and embrace what comes with it and we did and it's we're gonna have huge energy yep it's gonna be chirpy um, I don't want it to cross the line. There's, there's, you know, sportsmanship and all that. And, um, but if you embrace it, I think you get it because I think the difference that she brings to the challenger level is the precision in her gameplay. And then just, she can be a dominant player, um, in a challenger level women's match and paired up with Krista Getcheva, who's got so much pop herself. We just really went real offensive with the team construction. And I told a lot of people, we have a very high floor, I mean, very high ceiling, and our floor, depending on how all the emotions play <laughs> out, we, we, <laughs> we could be, we got to keep an eye on that. And, you know, we, we kept it in check. I think coming out the gate and winning the first match we had 4-0 was huge. And, uh, you know, that just sort of settles everybody in because no one was happy leaving Mesa. Mm-hmm. I feel like you were one of the earlier ones to pick up on Brandon French and his ability. Probably the Dallas connection helps there sure. too. But um, I guess what was the thought process in your, like take us through your GM perspective of the draft process, I guess starting with the challenger level of like, that is such an unseen entity of like, what are the challenges? You don't even know who's going to be available to you come pick time. I mean, how did that play out for you? And, prior to this point and then obviously how it all's come together. Yeah. I mean, I think the, you know, I went into it, I knew we had the third pick, so I wanted the best available female and that happened to end up being Megan. And I was very happy with that. Uh, ironically, we made the finals without our first two picks, which I really usually would not recommend, but that's the way it worked <laughs> out. Um, you know, I liked, I, I like Chuck Taylor. I, I, I think he's a great guy. We, well, he's we, a pickleball fa uh, finalist. I know that's, you watched us in that final and you were yeah. scouting him out. 
I thought you were looking at me and I was confused. It was Chuck, actually. (laughs) (laughs) I I was stunned that Casey Patterson wasn't in the pool. So yeah, yeah, he he just had a baby. Can't he couldn't take that. that Yeah, I've got to wait a little. Uh, Asterix, his wife had the baby. Yeah, that's true. I mean, (laughs) Casey did not have a baby. Sure. But he does have a baby at home. Yes. Uh, No, I think, you know, that one, I know uh, I get to see a lot of the players more than most. um, Is that a big advantage? I I think, I mean, for seeing, I think so. I mean, and and have a relationship with other players who I can talk to is equally as important, Tyson. Um, You know, so I went into it. I want to get the best player available. If I had to do the challenger level over again, maybe I'd make a a different change and try and draft for a little more upside than steady. And in essence, I ended up trading for that. And I think that's the, you know, the, my big thing that I was like, I'm not going to just sit here and let the same thing happen again in Daytona after Mesa with, with that team. And so we made the changes we talked about. So then the premier level dive into that process, because I know Ben Johns is obviously one of the best strategists of the game. He has his opinions on who he wants and doesn't want, but then you're the decision maker, right? At the GM level. So how did that, he went number two and then could uh, break down your sequence of the rounds and what went into that, how much of it was his opinion, how much of it was your insight coming into the draft did you have a strategy to go with all Utah based players <laughs> coming in you know, or was that just like the way it panned out? Yeah. The time spent with Casey as, uh, as yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm from uh, Utah, Dave. Well, sorry, Tyson. Sorry. <laughs> sorry I'm <dude>. not. <laughs> um, a couple things there. Number one, obviously getting Ben is a huge start to your, to your team. And, um, then, you know, we're immediately comparing notes and we were very much on the same page, which was really important. You know, the minute we picked Ben, Etta Wright was the name we were literally hoping. And that's a long way from mm. two to 23 to wait right. that out. And we're, come on, come on, come on, come on. So, so we were a hundred percent aligned on that. Then when it was our pick in the third round, there wasn't someone we were dying to have. So I think one of the big things that happened was I got in the draft room and just said, Hey, I want to trade. I want to trade back. I want to trade back. And and we did that. And we did that because we didn't see a huge difference in what was available there, but we saw this collection of guys that were like, not all of them can be picked before we'd pick if we could be early in the fourth round. So that was mm. crazy that you want to, you know, you want to talk about, you know, the, the, the tension of the general manager role. It's picking one of the offers where, how many spots back I've got 45 seconds to, you know, pick which one we want to go with and then pick one and make the trade. And that worked out great. We both wanted to get Megan in the spot that that we did, and then around the corner to have Tyler Loom again, Utah. Hello, Utah. I love to say hello, Utah. Um, to have Tyler Loom in the fourth round, are you freaking kidding me? A lefty, great singles player, mixed, perfect complement to Ben, because if you get two left side players, that can be a little bit of a challenge in Major League Pickleball. So I have a guy that plays the right all day long with Ben. That was, so things broke our way. We had to make that, that trade back in the middle and, you know, we're thrilled. Obviously we're not changing our team. So walk us through that a little bit more on a timeline. Like, so you are all in a room together. Like how, how quickly from when you chose Ben to when you chose your final player, how how long was that process? Is that just like a single day of all the GMs sitting in a room, or is that like a week long process? That was a Zoom call, actually, Tyson, where everybody was on okay. the call. So I think everybody had three minutes to make a pick. So if you've done fantasy football, it wasn't that dissimilar to that, quite frankly. Okay. 
Um, Interesting. And you so know, you're like adjusting on the fly based on who scooped someone from yes. you, and now you have to like readjust your strategy and stuff like that. One hundred percent. So it it was very much like that, and you know it's very much like the the other pro sports league. You're on the clock. Okay. It wasn't a okay. Send an email, Dave. Pick Ben, and then you know you got all kinds yeah. of time. That's that's what I wanted to know. Yeah, yeah. So, so. you, it's a, it's pretty high pressure, and you're like, yeah. oh, I got to make a decision. Yeah. Okay. So that's where preparation becomes so critical because well, and knowing to, the players too, and knowing the players, yeah, having exactly. your list of options in yeah. every yes. scenario. Yeah. So, okay, Th- cool. This is I want I want a follow up question on this because. You said something of Etta Wright being available at 23, so I have yeah. the draft order out now. So putting you on the spot a little bit. Yeah, sure. But here are the other women that went ahead of Etta. And and it, next draft, next season, where do you – how high do you think she should go? Okay, so obviously Annalie Waters, number one. Anna Bright, number four. Catherine Parento, five. Jesse Irvin at eight. Vivian David, nine. Andrea Coop, Callie Smith. Uh, Lucy Kovalova, Simone Jarjim, Irina Tereshenko, Jackie Kawamoto, and then Etta. What? How? Where does she rank in your mind, female wise? Uh, I think up, a, up a few spots, and then we'll see how she's playing in June. And then yeah. for this, it depends on what your intentions are with your team too. Because mm. is are you at the turn and you're going to take two men or two female or one or you know one or one or the other? You know, say ten and. And 15, that kind of, you know, what what is it going to be that you want to do? But I would expect, and I don't need, Etta Wright doesn't need me to be the head of her fan club, although I will happily accept that role <laughs> for sure. I think she'll be up above a few of those ladies and maybe several of them if her results continue. I mean, she's proven it. She's a champion from this weekend and deservedly so. Interesting. So what... You're, you win with Seattle. Yeah. You are runner up with Dallas in the Challenger League. So, what are those conversations between those with yourself and those two teams going into the final uh, part of this season? Is Seattle, are you just like, oh, just go to Margaritaville for a month, kick your feet up, and <laughs> play if you want, but, you know, really soak it in? Like, what? What things, because you can't, I mean, what are you supposed to work on? Are you still finding things to work on as Seattle that you could have done better? I think from the Seattle standpoint, and again, as I mentioned, it's very different. So from the Seattle standpoint, ladies, go keep working on your games as you clearly did. I mean, there's no doubt about it, how great they played. And as I said earlier in this discussion, they are going to get better just from more reps on the PPA. It's going to be fantastic to watch them play and perform and confidence. I mean, Casey and all of you guys know this. I mean, you walk out of there holding a trophy. Come on. I mean, that's better than any word I could say. And anything Ben could, I mean, you're holding a trophy. I mean, Megan Design's going on a cruise, man. She's the MVP. <laughs> okay, so just think about that. So that that team's just going to keep working on what they do. I think you know there's little things, but then you know MLP so matchup specific that you know we'll see what pool we get put in, and then, you know very couple of things as we get there where we want to put the ball and some of those things, but we're not working on that right yeah. now. So that, yeah. that, that will be very limited. I'll talk to them at the PPA events a little bit, but just keep playing and getting reps on the other side. We will definitely have discussions about how we can be a little more strategic play together get some practice together for those those four players and 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 go from there and i think you know but i don't see anything happen this week i couldn't be more prouder of both teams you know just go play and get yourself get yourself going so on the premier level side everyone was talking about group b being the gauntlet us included in last week's podcast and then it ended up being two teams out of group a which is i guess just shows the parody but i want to know how intertwined or what what how, how interactive are the owners because you work for two teams that one Seattle Pioneers owned by Tom Dundon and then Dallas owned by Mark Cuban Dirk Nowitzki John Isner 
and a couple other big name athletes. What's their reception to Major League Pickleball been like? What's the feedback? Do they give you full reign to say, Dave, we know you know, go? Do they, are they like, congrats? What's their, what's that like? Yeah, I think, you know, there's trust of what I'm doing. And I think, uh, you know, all the owners that are of that ilk are learning more about what Major League Pickleball is all about. And, you know, uh, Mark Cuban's business partner, Todd Wagner, came out to the event and, you know, seeing is believing. And uh, so the fact that he was there, you know, he said he was coming Saturday and I said, hey, I believe in my team, but the only way you're seeing Dallas is if we make the final. So uh, <laughs> that's pretty good when, when daddy's coming to see the team and, uh, and, 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 and uh, they came through. So, uh, so that was great for, I mean, we didn't win. We played a great match that day. But I think just seeing, you know, the energy and what it can be and, and how people of that influence, I think, now, I think that'll just, I think that's going to continue to grow. I mean, obviously, at the end of the last year, everybody's trying to figure out who's doing what, where with all this. And now, you know, as we go forward, um, and especially into 2024, where the teams will be set for the whole year and you won't be changing that, because I think that will be a little bit jarring just for a second for fans to understand why someone's wearing a different uniform. But uh, I think right. you'll see more and more from the owners. Yeah. Um, you also did touch on like, you're not going to do too much strategically necessarily until you see the draws. When you do see the group draws, how are you now reacting to that? Are you reviewing tape and doing all of that stuff? Or, you know, the players well enough that you are just like, Hey guys, this is what you got to look out for here. Yeah. I know some of the, I mean, the premier team has one of the best minds in, in the game, if not the best, and maybe his brother is better and Ben. So um, that is more a on-site having that positive vibe and just pointing out a couple things, especially to uh, Etta and Megan, uh, reminding Etta that she can be a beast and she was and getting off to that start like that. Um, don't ease into the match because in, rally scoring to 21 yeah, no time. that you don't have time to ease yeah. into a match. You just don't. So, uh, um, you know, just building up their confidence. And, you know, if, if we had a game plan, if we're not sticking to it, remind them of where, where we want to put the ball and things like that. Um, I think on the challenger side, we'll, you know, this was a, a wild ride this time because we put four new pieces together that had never been together other than, uh, you know, the two holdovers with Brandon and Krista and, you know, they didn't even, you know, they're not two people that have known each other for a long time. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of what are we going to do here and how are we going to perform and they perform well. So I think we'll do more of that going into it once we see the, the draws because the, like the men's match in the final Brandon and Daniel De La Rosa played just really, really smart pickleball. Didn't get caught up in driving everything, played at the kitchen line. And you can see the difference that uh, staying on point with the strategy can be because Pablo and Christian are two incredibly talented players. And, and Brandon and Daniel won a convincing match there, which was exciting. What do you think the convincing factor was for Tom Wagner that you said – got there i imagine that was his first time at the event so did you hear any response back from him because there's been chatter around um there's a, like a documentary crew that i got in touch with whatever anyways their point was like you don't get it until you are there and you're like okay i get it yeah what do you think was the aha factor for somebody like that who hadn't been to an event like Major League Pickleball, and then as an investor, as a team owner, what do you think his, his like, oh, this is something? Yeah, so Todd Wagner, um, just, uh, I mean, the energy, seeing Pickleball up close like that, I think, uh, you know, I love hockey. I'm a big hockey guy, and there's a lot of, you know, if you go to a hockey game, you feel the intensity and the rush and being there. I love hockey on TV, too, but being – being in the rink and seeing that. And I think there's some similarities uh, to pickleball from the standpoint of being up close and seeing the pace, the spin, especially 
is really hard to see. There's shots that these players pull off with spin that you just can't believe. And then the hands battles in person are, <laughs> are they're stupid. I mean, it's like, come on. And we love them on, on the stream. We love them on Tennis Channel and everywhere else that uh, the sport will, will be broadcast. And then seeing it in person and hearing it and feel the energy and seeing the players explode after a great point. I mean, how can you not get up and get caught up in that? And I think, uh, I think we'll only see that continue to happen um, across uh, these seasons as we continue to move forward. Last thing before we wrap here, Dave, hypothetical. You win with Dallas next event, and you also win with Seattle. <laughs> now, what would it take for a different ownership group to get you as GM? Is Ooh. that going to be the true battle wow. is who can get Dave That's Fleming as the question. GM? What's he going to do? I am not available. Dun, dun, dun. Not available? <laughs> no price. No price. So Nothing. Ever. If I gave okay. you like a used Range Rover, you're oh, still not coming over. Does Anna Lee's used Range Rover? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Maybe Wait. not. Maybe but not. what... But what about 2024? Yeah. These two teams could be in the same league. Oh, so then no, what? No, that's a different story. Because right 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 everybody's story. like, how can you be a GM of two teams? And, and, you know, what a what a privilege for me. There is no conflict currently because they will never play each other in 2023. However, right. my whole goal is to get both of them in the top half. And then I'm going to have to make a choice because I oh. always cannot and will not do both teams. So... You're putting yourself in a great spot, Dave. Well, it's smart. It's smart. He's... May the best chief win. I yeah. don't know. I helped you both get to the top. So Tyson, I'm okay with interim head coach, head manager with you if he needs someone to step in. Tyson yeah. okay. and I can step in. I like yeah, that. we'll step in on the other team. Yes. Yeah. Um, what about, uh, have you talked to MLP about just switching the rosters for the second half? Just be like, we'll just, just... flip them. <laughs> Flip flop. Dallas will become Seattle. Seattle yeah, will become Dallas, and we um, don't need to be on the Zoom call. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, like a keeper <laughs> keeper league in fantasy football. I need my keeper league in pickleball here. I will take that right now. I don't think the other eleven teams will sign up for that. But okay, um, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, um, I love my team. I wish I had them for longer, but. Uh, yeah. yeah, if if you guys can work the back channels and I can't, uh, right? Yeah, <laughs> but definitely well, cannot. I, no. Yeah, well, it should be it should almost be like a grandfather. in if your your challenger and premier both win in the same event, you get like, you know, you get some sort of one special power. caveat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're one wild one card. Special power. Yeah, why not? I like it, Dave. What's coming up next for you? Uh, PPA Red Rocks. So, uh, we'll be calling the action out there and, uh, just keep rolling through that. Then we're out in Newport beach and then, uh, North Carolina. So, uh, PPA season rolling along, you know, I'd love, I love watching the level that, uh, across the board. I mean, it's, it's, it's awesome that all the best players are playing MLP, that they're all together yeah. at, at PPA and just seeing what it takes to win. What it takes to win is unbelievable. You can tell the players have to put in so much work off the court because it is absolutely fierce. It used to be, you know, we can tell you who the quarterfinals and certainly the semifinals are going to be. Right. And Well, yes, the very, very top have been fairly consistent, but the battle just below that has been incredible. Mm -hmm. So I encourage people, as we talked about earlier, if it's near you, come see it in person. You can come play right next to them as well. PPATour.com has got all those uh, um, dates and sites and everything. But really seeing them up close really is different, folks. You know, it's, it's you know, people talk to me all about, you know, hey, what's the gap between the folks playing at the at the local park and these top <laughs> players it is a couple hundred miles folks insurmountable yeah it's it out of the country <laughs> it, ain't close. Yeah. Yeah. it ain't close and then when you really see it you go okay this is this is something i else. didn't know a human could do that right it's crazy <laughs> how it, it comes yeah. down to you know the athleticism you know like lots of people hit a volleyball around casey yeah but come on they, now yeah <laughs> Yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah, they go in person. They're like, I had no idea. Yeah. You're like a whole different. You're you like transform into someone else. Yeah. Like, not the guy we see at you know at the park or the basketball game for the kids. It's crazy. Yeah. 
Uh, where can people follow you on if they want to see all of your happenings and doings? And uh, I'm assuming you're a social media expert. Yeah, at Dave Fleming Speaks, come check it out. And then uh, I'll be on the call. And I think me and Mish coming up at some point, too. So That's that'll be right. awesome. Can't wait for that. Yeah, coming up in May. I'll be, uh, I think, uh, you t whatever the one after North Carolina is. Will be my love it big entrance <laughs> okay. for the remainder of the season. You have time for to get your outfit perfect. You have time. I have time yeah. to get my outfit. <laughs> and cool. also wanted to um, one last thing too. The pickleball slam is coming up, which um, Brooks Wiley, the commissioner, is playing in the tournament this weekend, leading into the slam, which I'm going to be picking Dave's brain about. That is uh, Andre Agassi, Andy Roddick. Chang McEnroe going at it for a million bucks on Sunday. So if you're wanting some pickleball, I am so fascinated to see how this turns out. A couple of tennis hall of famers squaring off for a million bucks. Like I think they're taking it seriously. Anyways, if you want to tune in, tune into that on Sunday, April 2nd on ESPN. Great. And you can follow all of the major league pickleball news. You can rewatch any of the matches from the past weekend. If you missed it or anything from the past, you go to major league pickleball.net and you can find the little watch now button at the top. Click that. Uh, you can follow them on all social medias to find out what's going on and get little pickleball tidbits. Uh, and that will do it for us on Inside Major League Pickleball. Until next week, see ya.